Before moving on, let's talk a little bit more about force field parameters. So if you look in the Webster's Dictionary, it says an, that a parameter is an arbitrary constant whose value characterizes a member of a system. So I kind of like that definition, so let's see how that applies specifically to molecular mechanics and force fields. So for the energy of molecular mechanics, uh, the bonded term, so the term for all the bonds, is that you sum over all the bonds. And then you have a constant Kb times R minus Req, the bond length minus the equilibrium bond length, squared. So that's the bonded term. Then there's the angle term, and et cetera. It goes on to the rest of the terms from there. But for this term here, let's just look at the bond term and see what those parameters are. So for the total energy, a unit that's typically convenient to express the total energy in would be something like kilocalories per mole, which is you know kilojoules per mole divided by 4.184, which is the conversion between a kilojoule and a kilocalorie, or a joule and a calorie. So kilocalories per mole. And then the unit that we have for R, the bond length, that's typically convenient to express in angstroms. So since the bond is in angstroms and we're subtracting it with the equilibrium bond length, it also makes sense that it should have the same units, so that REQ, our parameter, should also be in angstroms as well. So we know that this equilibrium bond length, if our bond is in angstroms, uh, should be in angstroms as well. But what about KB here? What about our uh, force constant or our spring constant for this bond? Very similar to the case for what we had for harmonic oscillator in the quantum chemistry playlist. Okay, so for that parameter, well, we know that we have energy in kcal per mole. So I have kcal per mole equals a sum of a bunch of things where we have something in unknown units times angstroms. And then so it's angstrom minus angstrom gives you angstrom. And then you square that so you get angstrom squared. So we have to cancel out this angstrom squared and get kilocalorie per mole. So that implies that a good choice for our units of Kb should be kilocalorie per mole times angstrom squared. So kcal per mole per angstrom squared. All right, so what's an example of some typical values that you see for these types of parameters? So the HO bond or the OH bond in H2O in amber, which is the force field that we're going to be using pretty typically throughout this chapter. So in that case, for amber, we have the equilibrium OH bond distance in water is equal to 0 0.960 angstroms. And KB is equal to 553.0 kcal per mole. <clears throat> So those are both fairly typical values in terms of the order of magnitude that these things generally are on. You generally expect bond lengths to be, you know, around an angstrom, somewhere between, say, 0.9 and 1.5 angstroms, maybe a little longer if it's something like a chlorine or a bromine involved in the bond, but they're typically around an angstrom. And the spring constants for bonds, this one's a little bit towards the high end, but typically they are in the hundreds of kcal per mole. That's the typical stiffness of a, of a chemical covalent bond. Okay, so those are the two parameters for that particular bond with that particular force field. Now you have to specify that for all of the bonds for this force field, for all the angles, and then there are different parameters for torsions and uh, electrostatics, van der Waals, etc. So you got a lot of parameters that you need to specify, and then they're also different in various force fields as well. So why that particular choice of these values for that bond for that force field. So there's a lot of different reasons why you could choose a particular value for uh, particular parameters for your force field. So some reasons are empirical because you might want to be you might want to have uh, some data that you get that from. So maybe they looked at the crystal structure of water ice and they found that in the crystal structure of 
of water ice that the equilibrium bond length or the average bond length of water was about this distance. Maybe they pulled it from there. You can also derive such values from IR spectra. You could also derive them from microwave spectra if it's a small enough molecule. So they can figure out those things uh, from those things. So maybe they directly pulled them from experimental data like that. Maybe there are various properties that they're hoping to reproduce with the system. So force fields like OPLS, optimized potential for liquid simulations, there might be a lot of liquid properties that they're interested in reproducing. So these might be things like maybe that's a value which helped them get closer to the actual density of water that they were hoping to get. Maybe it helped them with getting the correct melting point. And in fact, in force field development, there's you know perhaps dozens of different properties of interest which can help sway your choice in tuning what these values end up being. And then more and more, as computers become more powerful, as quantum mechanical methods get better, and there is a larger set of data that we have about them, maybe there's some ab initio or some first principles reason for why we choose certain values. So maybe you computed a potential energy surface of water. Maybe you did some advanced Hartree-Fock or coupled cluster, some advanced uh, quantum mechanical simulation, and you found that the minimum energy bond length for water with some very advanced quantum method, maybe that distance was about 0 0.960, and maybe fitting to that potential, you get 553 for that as well. Uh, in this case, uh, this particular value was probably developed in the, in the early 90s, so I'm thinking it's probably more in the properties uh, region here. But uh, in, in the future and in the present, all three of these are very valid reasons for, for singling out why you would choose those things. You would just want to document those things and be very clear about uh, what your choice was and why it was that particular choice. Okay, so some desired properties of various parameters when you're selecting them out. You'd like pro uh, parameters to be general, so you'd like them to work for many systems. So if I if my if my simulation works for octane, I'd like my simulation to work for decane too. You know, if it works for alcohols, I'd like it to work for ethers. So lots of things like that. If it works for a lot of chemical systems, it's a very general force field. And the most general force fields include even things like transition metals, uh, noble gases, ions, lots of things. You'd like your parameters to be transferable. You'd like to have the same or similar parameters for many systems. So my CH2 groups in you know, butane, I'd like my CH2 groups in pentane to behave similarly. Maybe they have the similar parameters, maybe they're exactly the same. I'd like an alcohol, I like the OH bond in ethanol to be behave pretty similarly to the OH bond in methanol or propanol. Lots of th possibilities there. I'd like my carbonyl bond in, in acetone to be the same thing as if, you know, acetone has a methyl group on each side. I'd like the same thing as if it was uh, an ethyl group on each side or a propyl group on each side. My carbonyl bond is pretty much unaffected in its properties, only a little bit different. And of course, what we would all like is for our simulations to be accurate in that they reproduce desired properties well. So we'd like our force fields to work for as many systems as possible. We'd like them to have as few parameters as, the, as they can to do that. And we'd like them to reproduce our properties well in our simulations and for them to be applicable uh, to, to simulating new properties which we haven't necessarily measured yet.